In this video on the Animal um, Kingdom series, we're going to be looking at the amphibians. There are 3,900 species of amphibians. Um, as we look at our class amphibia, these are going to be cold-blooded vertebrates. This means that they cannot control their body temperature. They have a backbone. They are going to have a close tie to water, meaning some part of their life cycle is going to be associated with water. Uh, a lot of times they're going to lay their eggs in the water. They're going to lack a lot of skin covering such as fur, scales, or feathers. And because of that, that thin skin that they have, these are going to be good indicator species of any kind of environmental issues going on, whether that be um, pollutants or possibly various types of uh, parasitic organisms that could infect the organism. So our young amphibians tend to resemble small fish because the word amphibian really means two lives and that's referring to the metamorphosis or the change that frogs go through as they move from egg to tadpole to frog. And even as adults, most frogs, again, uh, most of your other amphibians will have a close tie to water. So we're looking at the class amphibia and if we go kingdom, phylum, class, just below classes order, there are three orders of amphibians. There is the order Anura, which are the frogs and toads, the caudata, which are the salamanders, and the gymnophanoa, which are the Sicilians. And we'll show you what they look like in just a moment. In the order caudata, which are the salamanders and the newts. So now you know on the movies when they talk about eye of newt, what they're talking about. Um, they're going to have a long body. Uh, they'll have two pairs of legs. They'll have a tail. Uh, they're carnivores, but they have um, kind of peg-like teeth. Uh, they eat insects and snails. They also have a side-to-side -side gait. That means they kind of waddle when they walk. Now this right here is a horned toad. Uh, the horned toad is um, it's actually a reptile and not an amphibian. Now I'm placing it here because we call it a horny toad in Texas, uh, but I want to clarify that it is not a toad at all. It's actually classified as a lizard. But um, while I'm clarifying that for you guys, we used to catch these cute little guys when we were uh, with kids. And um, the skinks around here that you catch, and that my kids would catch when they were kids, um, you notice that when you grab them, if you grabbed them by the tail, they would lose the tail. And the tail would keep wiggling. And that was a protective mechanism for the, the skink to get away. So the predator has got the tail. The tail's moving. They thought that they, they've caught their prey. And now the little skink has, has moved away. Well, the horn toads, a little bit different. The horn toads didn't lose their tail. What they would do is they would shoot blood out of their eye. And it would scare the predator. They may drop it and it would get away. So many a Texas kid would catch these and then have blood all over their hand because the horned toad would shoot out the blood. But again, these, while they're called um, horned toads, they are not an amphibian. They are a reptile. This right here is an oxalot. Very cute. You can see the external gills on the outside. It just has a, a beautiful color to it. Uh, 2013 uh, survey in central Mexico determined that these were extinct in the wild. So uh, because of just uh, the pollution uh, in nature and just uh, as we have more and more people uh, moving to these remote areas, you're starting to see less and less of the oxalots. You can keep these as pets. They're, they're great little pets and it, uh, it does help to uh, conserve the species. But again, notice those beautiful external gills right across that salamander. Here we have the Sicilian. Uh, these are legless um, amphibians that burrow in this, the soil. Um, they feed on worms. They kind of look like a snake. They're not a snake. These are amphibians. Uh, and again, they also, by burrowing through the soil, are going to help to loosen that soil. They're going to help to aerate the soil. And that's going to help for, uh, for plant growth. Now, as we look at the anatomy and physiology of amphibians, 
Uh, the big one that we're going to be looking at is the frog. And so we will attempt uh, to do some kind of virtual frog uh, dissection as we uh, get through this time. But um, one of the things I would tell you would be to open up the, the mouth of the frog and you'd see that the tongue is attached to the front of the, the mouth as opposed to the back, like our tongues are attached. And that way it can roll out its tongue and it can catch the prey. It also has a um, membrane that covers the eyelids. It's called the nicotating membrane. It helps to keep the eyelids moist so they don't dry out. The ears on the, um, the amphibians, the frogs, are called the tympanum, just like our eardrum is called the tympanum, just like on the grasshopper where we saw the, the hearing structure on the, um, the uh, thorax, the abdomen in that area. We saw that as the tympanum. Also, ideally, I would have loved for you to uh, dissect out the brains. The brains are a little bit larger and more well-developed than you can see on the fish. Also, the amphibians have uh, small lungs, and they're described as two simple air sacs. The amphibians cannot get all the air that they need just through the lungs, so they breathing through the lungs is called pulmonary um, breathing. And then um, you also have uh, breathing or an exchange of gas through uh, the skin, and that's called cutaneous respiration. So the frogs have both cutaneous and pulmonary respiration. When we look at the frog's circulatory system, it is a closed circulatory system, meaning they have arteries and veins, and it has a three-chambered heart. It has two atria and one ventricle. That helps to mix the oxygen-rich blood uh, together to take it to all the parts of the body. So I do want to make sure that you know that it has um, uh, two simple air sacs for, for the lungs, that it has a closed circulatory system. Know that it has a three-chambered heart, two atria, one ventricle, and know the type of breathing, uh, cutaneous and pulmonary respiration. So the skin is uh, thin and smooth. It's not scaly. Um, it does have various mucous glands, which will help it to keep from drying out with that cutaneous respiration. Um, but it also will allow the, uh, the amphibians to take in pollutants in the air. And so malformed frogs are a good indication that you have something going on in the environment. Um, Many years back, a teacher took their, uh, their students to a pond. They were collecting toads, and uh, the toads were malformed. They, instead of having two hind legs, they'd have three, four, five, de uh, just really deformed hind legs. Uh, the teacher called uh, the local uh, wildlife in, um, warden. They went down, checked it out. They checked for uh, pollutants, because that would have been a good indication of, of pollutants, and they found that no, what was going on was there was a high level of nematodes, roundworms, and the roundworms were getting into the frog eggs, causing the eggs to have deformities and caused, as a result, for the hind legs to have deformities. But the frogs were an indicator species that there was a higher than normal level of nematodes in that environment. The amphibians are also ectothermic, and what that means is that they're cold-blooded. So when the winter temperature drops, a lot of these are going to become very inactive. They're going to enter kind of a hibernation uh, type of um, situation. Now this first sentence is a very good test question. The colon, which is the intestines, and the bladder both empty their waste into the cloaca. So both the poo and the pee go out the same structure called the cloaca. Next sentence very good test question. Uh, on males, there is an oviduct structure. Uh, it, 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 there's a structure that looks like an oviduct on a female, but it is not. It's called a vestigial oviduct. So the structure on the male that resembles the oviduct on the female is called the vestigial oviduct test question. If you were to dissect the frogs and you were to lift up the organs, you would also have to get your tweezers and tear through some tissue and behind that tissue is the kidneys. So because the kidneys are behind all of the organs of the body, and because they're behind that tissue, we say the kidneys are retroperitoneal. Test question. Again, if we were able to dissect 
uh, the frog, we would have you open up its mouth. We would have you get the pointer or the probe, run it across the inside of the mouth, and you would feel really tiny, tiny little teeth. And those are maxillary teeth. And then if you were to look at the roof of the mouth, you would see these two bumps, and you run it across those. Those are vomer teeth. So it uses those vomer teeth to help hold um, its prey, it, it's the insects in its mouth. Now frogs don't have a diaphragm, so what they have to do is they have to um, gulp in their uh, air, close their nose, close their mouth, and force swallow that oxygen down into their lungs. And that's called positive pressure. We want you to know that. Another thing, frogs do not have ribs. So make sure each of these sentences on this page you know because they're all test questions. So frogs and toads are tailless as adults. They tend to, um, to have a head and a trunk that's fused together. Um, they do not have ribs. A lot of their uh, skeleton, you're going to see the, the bones are fused. For example, in our lower arm, uh, we have two bones. We have the radius and ulna. They have one bone fused together called the radial ulna. In our uh, leg, our lower leg, uh, where we have the shin, we have two bones. We have the uh, tibia and the fibula. They have one It's fused called the tibiofibula. So you're going to see some modifications and some adaptations for the niche that the frog lives in. However, because the frog was created by God, we can look at comparative anatomy. It's going to have the same bones. Again, they're adjusted for the niche that God put the, the frogs in, but it makes it very easy for us to see those structures. It makes it very easy for us to dissect all the various specimens because once we see the heart, the heart always looks like the heart. The, the lungs always look like the lungs. The liver always looks like the liver. And we see that because we have the same creator. So here you can see the stages of development for the frog, that metamorphosis that it goes through from the fertilized eggs um, over to uh, the tadpole. And then as the tadpole begins to develop, you can see the hind legs form. Then you can see the front legs formed. However, it still has some of that, uh, that tail and then finally becoming the adult frog. And I wanted to just put a couple of uh, slides up here just again to show you how beautiful God's creation is and how, how in every animal species we look at, we can just see a, a, um, an artist and we can just see a purpose in every aspect. Now, in addition to that, you're going to notice that um, this is a beautiful color on the frog, uh, but that frog is also an indication that uh, it's poisonous. So that would indicate, hey, Predators, don't mess with me. And then we can move to this little tiny guy right here with those big, beautiful eyes. And again, just taking a moment to just take in and look at the beauty, the, just the beauty of God's design. And right here, talking about beauty of God's design and, and God's sense of humor, this is the Kermit Frog. This was found in Costa Rica uh, several years back. It is a glass frog. But notice how much it, it resembles Kermit the Frog. However, if we take that same frog and we look at his belly, you can see the heart and you can see those blood vessels coming off and you can see the internal organs. And so he's a glass frog that you can see all of these internal structures. And it's just amazing what we can see when we take our time to look at some of these beautiful specimens.